God is faithful. Well, you should have outlines. We did outlines because the screen is down. So how many of you do not have an outline? Oh, my goodness. Everybody was in the choir didn't get one. And you won't know what's going on without one. You have to just listen. Unless you brought your Bible. Oh, you need your hands up. I think, I think they printed out the scriptures for you, too. So, hallelujah. Well, bless the living God. Hallelujah. Is this working good? Yep. Well, for those of you online, and oh, is that? Oh, it is on. Okay, good. Uh, how many of you were with us on our internet last night on the webinar? Anybody on the webinar last night? One person. Two. Okay. All right. If you need an outline, get raise your hand. The ushers will give you one. Some things are happening in the spirit, and I encourage you on the second <coughs> and fourth Tuesday to make sure that you go on the webinar. We have a time where we get a lot of interaction and you, you can ask questions uh, specifically relating to areas of your life and, and we answer them. I, we had a ton of emails last night and uh, it was an awesome time sharing and answering different areas and seeing breakthroughs in God and people being healed and set free and it, it's just a joy. So on the second and fourth Tuesday night we do these webinars. It is an awesome time in God. So you just go on to Victory Experience or Jesus Experience and go on to the webinar section and you'll be right there. And if you're wondering why I have a sling, how many of you were not here on Sunday? Oh my goodness, well, most of us. Well, if you weren't here on Sunday, I explained I was getting Little Feb an ice cream cone two Monday nights ago. And as I was delivering faithfully his ice cream cone, I slipped and ended up messing up my shoulder. So now it's got a week or two left in this thing and I'll be fine and everything's great. God's on the move and... Just don't be distracted by this hand that waves at you from one location because when I say lay hands on the sick, I might lay hand on the sick tonight. So, hallelujah. But that's the end of that story. Everybody got an outline? You know, something's been going on in the spirit and I don't know what you're experiencing in God, but what I'm experiencing is an unfolding of being able to see what's happening in people's lives and why. To be able to detect not just the origin of information, but the cycles of thought, behavior, and motivation that have crippled and demeaned people and held them in a level of bondage. And tonight we're going to talk about the blame game. Uh, on Wednesday nights we've been dealing with the uh, foundation, the unshakable foundation. But tonight I, I just got stirred. We needed to, to just deal with this particular message because I think it's very pertinent as to what goes on in our minds. And I think for sure you're going to get some insight. How many ready to see how life works in your thinking? This will be an eye opener. So Father, we just open our hearts to you. Let's just pray together and believe God to unveil himself. God, we trust you tonight as we go through your word that you'll reveal the way that we think so that we can get your thoughts. Because if we can bring down the strongholds, imaginations, and high things through you, we can avail in every situation and prevail with the nature of Christ Jesus. And we thank you, Lord, for the grace of God that prevails in us, in Jesus' name. Amen. Take a look at Colossians 1.21, and we're talking about the mindset that wants to blame somebody for what happens. How many of you go through blame in your mind? Somebody's got to pay for what took place. Somebody's responsible. Somebody's going to be the cause of the effects that I'm going through. And in the psyche of humanity, there is this mindset that wants to lay blame. And every time there's blame, there's the capacity of not hearing from God. We'll, we'll see it here in the Word. It says, and you, that were sometime, at some point in life, alienated, which is a non-participant, and enemies in your mind by wicked works, Yet now hath he reconciled or brought you in right standing with himself in the body of his flesh through death to present you, how? Holy, and what's that next word? Unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard, which was preached unto every creature which is unto heaven, Whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Now, it's an interesting reality that when God raised us in Christ Jesus, he presented us to our Father, holy and unwhat? 
Now, unblameable means there's not an accusation that will be able to alight on your life. And the next word is unreprovable, meaning that you can't get better than what he raised you to. Now, if I asked you if you were at the highest point of all that God had called you to, how many of you would say, this is the highest point of God's fulfilled calling in my life and I'm walking in it right now? How many of you would say that? Oh, wait a minute. Let me say it again. How many of you would say that you're living at the highest point of what God has raised you to in Jesus Christ? Wave at me. Why wouldn't you raise your hand? Did he raise you and present you holy, unblameable, and what's that next word? That means that there's nothing to correct. So let me ask you again. How many of you, before God, are at your highest place that God has raised you to, to fulfill the highest dynamic of God's calling in your life? How many of you are already there? All right. Now, the difference between the first thought and the second thought was, I read it, but you didn't hear it. And then when you heard it, you were, had to decide, is that really me? And then when you decided it really is me, then something had to act in you that said, well, then, if I don't, then I'm acknowledging he didn't do it. Right? Because if I'm the result of the perfect sacrifice, then something must be present that is more than what goes through my mind. And if anything's going through my mind that is contrary to what is present in God, what do I do with it? So tonight we're calling it the blame game. It's the the mindset that wants to find somebody at fault because something else should be going on. We've extensively studied, look over here in your introduction, the truths of Jesus' death, blood, and resurrection. In fact, and and I think the series is now finally available. I don't know if they're still making them up for orders, but the one on evidence, and it is an eye-opener. It says, in fact, we're the product of Jesus' perfect sacrifice and that he has forever established us in God himself. Now think about it. You don't establish yourself in God. He did. He had you sacrificed in his death, he raised you in his power, and he made you sit together with him in heavenly places. He presented you holy, unblameable, unreprovable in his sight. So it wasn't based on you, it was based on what he did. It says, now we must think and speak according to his life, not the norms of man or the religions of man. This message is a major shift from the way man normally thinks. Under the nature of sin, which is missing the mark, the mind of man looks for who to blame when something goes wrong. Who's at fault? Who do I hold accountable? If man's mind is on the flesh, he cannot hear from God. And we're going to look at the beginning of the the sin of Adam, and then we're going to go through the word and find out what happened with the enemy and what he does. And the real of your life and my life is we have become so familiar, if you will, with the consciousness of sin, the awareness of having missed the mark, that there's a mindset that I can't acknowledge that the work is finished because there's resolve or results that are going on that are not in the scope of what I perceive and believe should be happening. And what happens when something doesn't happen? Have you ever had what we would call a failure in faith? What you believed God to do, and it didn't happen, and a catastrophe, some detriment or harm took place. How many ever had one of those? How many of you then held yourself at a place, well, what did I do wrong? You ever hear that? Then how many of you thought, well, I didn't have enough faith to believe? Or maybe you think, well, maybe I didn't know enough, and because I didn't know enough, I didn't do enough, so because I didn't know enough, didn't do enough, it must be my fault. So there is a constant drone of who is to blame for everything that doesn't work to your expectation. Think about the realm of expectation. You have an expected end, and it doesn't manifest in the way you expect it. So what happens in your thinking? Somebody's got to be at fault. Well, take a look here in Genesis 3, verse 6. 
Look what happens in the onset of sin. Now, we've read this before many times, but I want you to think about the terms of your life. When something occurs, no matter what occurs, Genesis 3, verse 6, it says, The woman saw the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eye, the tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and ate and gave it also to her husband with her, and he did eat, verse 7. And the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together, made themselves aprons, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where are you? And Adam replies, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And... God speaks to him, verse 11, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree whereof I commanded you that you should not eat? Now, this is a very simple request. Who told you and did you do what you shouldn't have done? So how many know what the answer is? Well, I heard it from another spirit. I didn't hear it from you. And I violated what you said. So I mean, the answer is pretty simple. But what happens is an accusation, not just accusing his wife, but his major accusation is against God. Look at what he says. The man said, the woman who you gave me to be with me. Now, who is he really blaming? He's blaming God. He said, if you didn't give her to me, I would have never done this. I mean, after all, you gave me somebody that has such influence that I'm just powerless over whatever her decisions are. Have you ever felt like somebody had so much influence over you, they were to blame for your actions? That's exactly what Adam did. Adam excused himself, accused God and his wife, and had no answer for who told you. The question I want to ask you is, who tells you to blame? Where do you get the thought from that says someone is to blame? Where does it come from? Where does the consciousness come from that there is blame, and when there's blame, there must be a penalty to pay for an action or a word spoken or done. So he says, the woman that you gave me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what have you done? And the woman said, the serpent, the serpent, he tricked me, and I ate. Adam never answers who told him, or did he take responsibility for his actions, but he blames God blames Eve and excuses himself. We call it the fig leaf syndrome, but there is something that is far more going on than with the male because it is systemic in all mindsets. And that is that if any promise of God, which gives me the nature of God, is not fulfilled in the perspective in which I see it, there must be somebody to blame. Either I'm going to blame God I'm going to blame my family. I'm going to blame the history I grew up in. I'm going to blame the people I've been with. I'm going to blame what I never knew that the preacher never told me. I'm going to blame. Somebody is going to be to blame. I'm going to blame myself. Because I've, after all, if I don't blame somebody, this satisfaction of blame must find a resolve. Have you got that going on in your thinking? What's interesting is when we get prayer requests, and last night we went through these on the, on the webinar, every single conflict, as it was brought for prayer, amplified the present tense of the situation, and then said, would you pray for this to go away? Now, I would imagine that's not the first time they prayed about it. I would imagine that they had asked other people to agree with them to have these things end as well. How many of you prayed over a couple things once or twice? How many of you didn't get results like you were looking for? So then what do you do? You look for somebody who can get the results you're looking for. But subtly what takes place internally is the other prayers weren't sufficient. They didn't get the breakthroughs we were looking for. So there's this subtlety of blame and accusation that goes on. Then there becomes a voice that says, well, why don't you get it yourself? Well, then the mindset comes, well, I've been blaming myself my whole life for what I've been going through. 
So how can I come out of this mindset that has affected me? Sometimes people are held under this stronghold of the enemy their entire life. When we think about blame, look at your notes there, it says blame is generally the first thought that passes through one's mind. If you think about it, the first thing I said, how many of you are living at the highest of God's call and fulfillment? It was like a couple half masks went up. Because the first thought is no. Because look at what's going on. Then if you follow off that thought, what's the next thought of look what's going on? Well, who's to blame for what's happened? Because it's not, look how awesome it is. It's look what's happening. So what's going on in our thinking? What has Jesus done to change it? And where are we in the midst of this change? Because if we don't apply what Jesus has given to us in our thought process, then our mind cannot be renewed. In other words, there is a fundamental foundation that must be laid in my consciousness so that I'm aware of what Jesus did and not aware of the circumstances and actions of others around me. How many of you think that you've been a product of sin? People missing it and you being in consequence of their actions. I fell on a floor that had grease on it. So who is to blame? It's not the floor. The floor didn't put the grease on it. And the guy was standing there with a mop. The problem is he didn't clean it up. And the sign was there in his hand, but he never put it down. And the manager was there to make sure nobody walked in it, but he never said anything. And I walked in it. So the question comes down to who is to? Because the first thought in your mind is who's to blame? Well, but where did the grease come from? So then it, you can go back and you could, you could, I mean, this thing can go on and on and, and it happens. It happens in a paycheck. It happens in any situation you go through, a conflict somebody has with you, and there's looking for blame. When we think about this, we can blame our past, we can blame yourself, blame the preacher, blame, blame your lack of faith. But there's something that God has given to us that we must judge as a victory because if we don't judge this victory rightly, this thing will affect our thinking to no end. And we will go down a road that will hold everybody in our life hostage by a sense of blame that God never laid on them. But when we do it, we don't want to be blamed for anything. So, what happens is, we end up blaming ourselves. Take a look at 2 Corinthians 5.14. We've read this many times, but I want you to see the mindset here. It says, the love of Christ constrains us, governs and guides my life, because I judged something. To make a judgment means I've taken all things into account, and I've rendered a final decree. Everything assessed in the environment of life, this is my final decision on this issue. That if one died for all, then all were dead. This judgment is one that if I don't make that judgment, I hear blame constantly. I hear blame without resistance. I hear blame without any other thought, it just peruses through my mind. It says, the way the love of God works is that we make a judgment that if one died for all, then were all what? Dead. And he that died for all, they which live, should from that point forward henceforth not live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, because of this and from now on, we don't know any man after the flesh. Yes, even though we've known Christ after the flesh, yet now we know him no more. Therefore, if any man beware, in Christ he is a what? Old things are passed away. Now, what is one of the major old things there? Knowing man after their actions, right? So, how many of you know somebody, how many of you know you after your actions? I was talking to somebody the other day, and I had my sling on, and they said, yeah, I'm accident prone. I said, why would you say that? 
They said, because I'm always falling and I'm always having accidents. I said, wait a minute, is that how you think? And they stopped. They looked at me. They, they said, oh, I guess I'm not. I said, because that judgment of your life is one of condemnation. How many have a judgment that has categorized you in an area that God did not raise you to? I seem to fall short when I get to this place in life. I seem to not know what to say when I get to this time in life. I, I, I just falter. I, I don't know how to cope. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. And as this judgment is there, we have no capacity of hearing from God. If we don't judge that one died for all, therefore how many were dead? All are dead. Paul made a statement. He says, I don't even judge myself. Meaning that once I've identified I'm the product of that sacrifice of Jesus, I don't evaluate my actions based upon the results. Because I know that I'm the result of the sacrifice of Jesus, not the result of my actions. So I don't know what you go through in life, but if you perceive yourself as the result of your words and actions, then you have plenty to what? Blame. But if you see yourself as a result of what Jesus did, then you have how much to blame? Nothing to blame. How many of you have recognize that judgment, but in your thinking, there's still blame going on. I mean, you guys, it still goes on. It's, it still speaks. And how do we shut it down? Because as we're going to go through the scripture, we find out that you cannot hear the voice of God when the thought of accusation is present. You can't. It is impossible. Let's read on. Therefore, verse 17, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new and all things are now of who? Now that's a problem because I guarantee you, you do not judge everything from God in your life. How many of you think a lot of things going on are not of God? Now let's just take it. If you can take a sheet of paper and say, this is not from God. This is not from God. How many of you got a list of stuff you wouldn't categorize as of God? Just. So then what's not of God, who do you blame? Because you can't just say it's not of God without it being in a realm of blame. Because somebody's got to be the cause of it. And if it is caused by you, then you have self-condemnation. If it's caused by another then you judge them as being the cause of your malady and conflict. If it's caused by God, then you blame God for it. But one thing's for sure, if you can't see that you are new and everything is what? Of God. The only thing you've got is blame. Because there's nowhere else to go. There's nowhere else to go in interaction with people. There's nowhere else to go in a future plan of life. Because if somebody says, why did this happen? you have to explain and find blame for an event. Because after all, isn't that what everybody does? Doesn't everybody, in almost all language, blame someone else for what they're experiencing? Just, just think about the people you talk to, the conversations that occur. And what if the language was, my life is now of God? I'm not the product of the event of somebody else. As a matter of fact, I've made a judgment that one died for all and I don't know anyone after the flesh. I don't have consciousness of anyone's actions or words that have been contrary that induce an accusation or a blame in my life because I made a judgment that one man did it all. Did it so perfectly I can't improve it. And did it so well, it affected the consciousness of my persona that I have nothing in me that blames another person. It doesn't exist. So if it doesn't exist, what do you fill up as a vacuum of thought? Do you ever, have you ever thought about the scripture, we cast down imagination, strongholds, and high things and take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ? If you cast down every thought that God did not author, Every imagination that's centered that God did not initiate, every high thing that obstructs his life, everything that induces blame, everything that brings accusation, and your mind never had a thought again from any of those realms, what would you think about? What would be there? 
I was with somebody the other day and they said, you know, I don't know if I'd have a thought at all. And they were very serious. They said, if I didn't listen to the rhetoric of the broken records in my thinking, I don't know if I'd even have a thought. I said, what does that do to you? I said, it scares me. Because I'm familiar with how I think. But if I got to the place where I stopped how it came, I'd have to get a new thought. How many could use a new thought? I mean, one you never had. One that emanates from the nature of God. One that has no blame tied to it, does not have an accusation, did not originate with a human action, but originated by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. One that comes from God himself, called the wisdom of God. Well, let's read on. It says, therefore, verse 17, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Everything that I've judged of human activity or attitude or action is over. Now I behold, all things are become what? New, and all things are of God, who hath reconciled himself, reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. So this is what that ministry is. Now you, you look at it and we talk about this is getting people saved. No, it's not. It says, to which God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So, not saying they are held for their mistakes. Just ask your neighbor, have you made any mistakes lately? Have you missed it? I mean, has there, has there been a slip anywhere? So, if it occurs and the word that we have is they are not held to the account of their action because there's nothing in me that imputes sin in the person nothing in me imputes sin in the person nothing holds them to what they said or did nothing acknowledges and blames them for their words and actions because I have a different word in me that's in the norms of minds of men the word that's resident is that it's been reconciled. And the word is that you are not held bound. You are not held captive. You are not held in reaction or response to your sin. So I have a word of reconciliation in my spirit. And that liberates you from all blame. All blame. All blame. You know what would happen in an argument if you did not impute the sin to another person? You could not argue. Do you know what would happen with the disagreement if you had nothing that you could not impute sin that they missed it to another person? You, you couldn't disagree. It's an amazing phenomenon. Just consider that you have a living word in you and the living word does not impute sin to a person. It doesn't. It has no record. It has no knowledge. It has no blame. So something's going on in the atmosphere of God. I, I, I'm, I'm in prayer in this whole dimension, and, I, and we've been exercising the, the power of Jesus' sacrifice, the, the remission of sin, and the recognition of his blood. And, and I recognize the volume of blame that is in the atmosphere is just overwhelming. It's not just symptomatic, and it's not in specific issues. It is cross-environment and reaches almost all atmospheres of human experience. It says, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So there's two things here. One is there is no account of whatever error has occurred. And second, there's a word that restores them to God in the fulfillment of his design. Not only is there not imputing of sin and trespass, but there's also now a word that connects them to communion with the living God. So nobody's to blame. You say, I, I talked to somebody the other day and they said, well, then that gives me the freedom to do what I want. And I said, you know, you do what you want anytime, anyway, anytime. I mean, it's, I don't control what you say or do. You do what you want anyway. Do you think that because I'm a pastor, you do something right? I mean, I'd be foolish to think that. 
If I thought you acted right because of me, I'd be absolutely off my rocker. Because why would I have more influence over you than Christ? But I do know one thing, and that is that I can hold you to no account. I cannot impute your sin unto you, and I can have in my voice a word that connects you to the living God. And therein, you have the grace of God forbearing in your life. You say, well, what's the difference? Well, the difference is, if I think that somebody does something because of me, I'm in major error. But if I know they do it because of what he did, I have a word that speaks what he did and that connects him to who he is. How many have some people you need to connect to what he did and who he is? Connect them. Not imputing their trespasses unto them and giving to us the word that reconciles and connects them to the living God. It says, now, then we are ambassadors for who? Christ. We're the emissaries, the, the ones released from his grace and power, the one who speak on his behalf, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you, in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. For he, the Father, made him to be sin for us, who never knew sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, something's going on in this nature of not imputing to a person. If my mind goes into blame, I hold them accountable for what they say or do. If I stand and I hold nothing in account, now I've got to do something. Because it's not enough to just say they are freed, because they must be connected. It's just like if, I, if my mind was shut down from all the accusations and negativity and perceptions that occur, what would be there? What would go on in my thinking? What would I hear? What would I say? What would I do? If you think about the body of Christ where Jesus Christ is the head, and we are designed to function out from his initiative. And if you look in Matthew or in John chapter 3, when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus and he says, and the son of man, which you're seeing is in heaven. And here's this man standing in front of the religious re leader and he's in communion with a living God. That's what you end up being. You end up not being in communion with what somebody said or did, but you end up being in communion with who Christ is in you. And now you speak not like you would say something, but you speak like God is speaking something. Take a look over here with me to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12. Now think about what Jesus did. It says, this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins for how long? Forever. Now, now think about it. There is nothing else that can be done for the sins of man but one sacrifice. Sorry isn't enough. If I say sorry, it's not enough. Have you ever had somebody do something, and when they said sorry, it was like, you owe more than that. <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, I want, I want like, I want a pound of flesh out of this thing. I want you to suffer. You know. Well, there's no other sacrifice. So if there's no other sacrifice, and I cannot hold somebody to a standard Jesus didn't hold them to. I can't do it. Because if I do it, then I have negated what he did and set up a standard that God's sacrifice through Christ was not sufficient. This man, after he'd offered one sacrifice for sins for how long? Ever. Sat down on the right hand of God. And from that point forward, his expectation was that his enemies are made his footstool. Now, we know man is not his enemy. We know man is God's habitation. We know sin is his enemy. We know the enemy is his enemy. And it says, from henceforth, he is expecting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering, he has forever what? Made complete, whole. Them that are set apart wholly for God's use. Now, how many of you are already at the highest point of completion that God has ever called you or designed you to walk in? How many are already there? You're not there by your environment. You're there by the action of Jesus Christ. You're not what you are by what you think. 
You are what you are by what he did. And then what he did changes what you think. Because if he did what I thought, he would have never done it. Because I was still alienated and an enemy in my mind by wicked works. Yet, he still reconciled me. So he didn't do it because of what I thought. He did it to change the way I think. So if my thought process is alienated from the way he did it, then what has to change is the way I think. How do I think? How do I perceive? How do I understand? How do I interact with people? It says, let's take a look at it. For by, one, four, sweet, 14, by one offering, he has perfected for how long? So it means that there's no more benefit. That's why you are called unreprovable. You can't be fixed. You're not broken. It, there's no improvement. Just, just look at your neighbor and say, you can't get better. You can't get higher than the most high. You can't get more complete than complete. You can't get more perfect than perfect. You say, well, pff, you don't know my life. Oh, yeah, I do. I know you are either the product of sin or you're the product of Jesus. I don't know about you. I know plenty of what the product of sin's like. What is needed is what is the product of Jesus like. It says, we have forever perfected them that are sanctified. Because of this, the Holy Spirit also is a witness to who? To us. Meaning that if I didn't get it by the written word, the Holy Spirit himself is present to bring the proof of it. It says, for after that he said this before, meaning that now he's present because it was spoken before. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in my minds, their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more what? There's nothing, their sorry is never going to get it. It's not because of how bad I feel or how much I turn. It's about what did he do? Because if he did it and I'm the product of it, then anything that missed it is because of the fact that now I now am the result of what he did. You say, well, where's the recognition for what missed it? There isn't one. Because if I recognize what didn't do it, then what I've done is I've bound myself into what I've missed. But if I recognize what he did that fixed what was missed then I'm brought into completion in the presence of the living God and what was even in my mind by wicked works is reconciled. My thinking gets reconciled. My mindset shifts to a different dimension. Listen to the rest of it. It says, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, to go boldly into the very throne of God, not by... I need to get it together, not by it's got to get better or, or I don't know what I'm going to do, not by any other means, but by the blood of Jesus Christ, by a new and a living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh and having a high priest over the house of God, which we are, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from a what? What does an evil conscience do? It is the consciousness of sin. So my conscience, by the blood of Jesus, is sprinkled and there is no account that's held. So if no account is held, nobody gets blamed. If nobody gets blamed, it's impossible to argue. If it's impossible to argue, I don't have a position to defend. And if I don't have a position to defend, I'll get a word that'll connect you to God. Because if I'm adversarial, you'll be positional against me. But if I hold nothing to your account in any action, word, or deed, and you know it. Have you ever been with somebody that you knew had something against you? They didn't have to say it. You just knew it because they were present. Anybody ever, they, you may have never heard them. They may have never said anything in your presence. There was a fellow I was 
in an office the other day and this, this fellow who was probably 50 years old, he may have been three foot five, and he walks in. And as soon as he comes in the room, everybody looks at him. So what I decided to do was look at everybody looking. Because I just wanted to see what they thought. So I sat there and watched what everybody thought. And then I watched how did he respond to the way that they thought. And not a word was said. Get up in his chair, turned his back on everybody, opened up a book and started reading it. Because he decided well before he got in there how they were going to think about him. Because this wasn't his first time. How many of you are in a situation where it's not your first time coming under somebody's blame? Or somebody's scrutiny? Or somebody's judgment? Or somebody's misunderstanding? And the next thing you know, you set up a behavior pattern in defense of what you know they're going to have a judgment on. And when you set up a behavior pattern in defense of it, you're already adversarial. There's no way you can go in that room and embrace those people. You, you'll go in the corner, dig your face in a book, and hide because you don't think anybody there is capable of even communicating with you. And so he sat there for about 15 minutes, got up, walked into his appointment, never interacted with anybody. When he came back out again, I said, hey, buddy, I said, how you doing? He was shocked somebody even talked to him because he was expecting no one to interact with him. He already had himself judged. The mindsets of people were in the judgment. It was already present. How many people do we hold in that limitation? Either by what we see. I mean, it happens with people that are obese. It happens with people that are extremely thin. It happens with people that didn't do their hair that day. It happens with people that did do their hair that day. It happens with people that got dressed up. It happens with people who didn't get dressed up. It, ha it, it doesn't matter what you do. Somebody has this judgment going on and you know it. The question is, what do you do with it? How do you handle it? How do you handle an atmosphere that you know is adversarial? What do you do with the sin that's coming against you? When you know it's present, what do you do with it? What do you do when you know judgments are in the room and you really are not going to defend yourself because you've already been through the argument before you got in the room? Anybody ever been there? How many go through these thoughts? We have fights before we ever get to the person. By the time we get there, we've either beat them up, took them down, and we're conquered, or we're beat up and we're drug out and we walk in beat up. And we're thinking, I just haven't got to the room yet. They may not even be in there. But I'm going through all of this stuff. Why? Where'd it come from? What's my mind supposed to be like? How am I supposed to walk in anywhere? What is my persona like if I am to live under God because I've made a judgment, one died for all, therefore all are dead. And if I have a conscience sprinkled from an evil awareness. Our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promise. What profession of faith is there in a purged conscience? What do I say? What's my profession of faith? How many of you know what faith is? The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, right? Okay. Well, what do I say? Here I am. Let's just take me being a mental patient coming out of the mental hospital here at Seven Stacks down the road here at Farnhurst. And you find out that I was locked up for the rest of my life. The problem is, it doesn't matter what you think, it really matters what I think. Because how I think about me is ultimately how you're going to receive me. Because it can be a historic fact without any mark on my life whatsoever, or it can be a historic fact that governed my life from, today, from that point forward. The key is, how do I think? Because the event occurred... The question is, now that the event occurred, who's to blame? 
Do I let it speak or do I bring it down? Have you got something in your life that speaks before you arrive? Every one of us do. Pastor Chris, what are you known as? What am I known as? Yeah, if, if some, it just... <laughs> what are you known as? African. Now, why would you say that? <laughs> why would you say you're known as African? Do you know you as African? No. <laughs> It was a setup <laughs> because I know that Chris thinks he's African, but he's not. He doesn't know he's not yet. He thinks he is, but he's not because he's a new creation in Christ Amen. Jesus. And the fact is there's either bond or free, Jew or Gentile. Right. There's neither Greek that doesn't exist. Right. So what else are you known by? <laughs> You said what? <laughs> he's, he's looking for <laughs> answers. You know the answers. What else are you known by? I'm a new creature. What else are you known by? By the life of God. I have divine nature. Yeah. You see, <laughs> now he's going to think about what he's going to say next, right? <laughs> Thank you. I knew it would come out <laughs> because these are the first thoughts we get even knowing we shouldn't say it it comes out even knowing how many think he knows not to say that he knows not to say that why does it why is it our profession? Why do we make statements about something that we're not when it really is irrelevant to who we are in Christ? But because it's how we think, it's what other people receive from us. What if you never thought of yourself other than what Jesus made you? What if you never saw yourself anything other than what Jesus made you? What would your environment hear about you before you arrive? Now just think about it. If you thought of you after what Jesus did, and you never thought about you in the text of any, because you made a judgment, one died for all, therefore all were dead. You do not know you after the flesh. Now, that judgment in your life doesn't just affect you. It affects every person that looks at you. It affects everyone that hears from you. It affects every way that you interact with them. Because that judgment clears the conscience from the evil operation, the human identity, and acknowledges what he did is what I am. Now, this is a bold reality about our, because this is where we live. We put out in our environment how we perceive ourselves every day of the week. I remember when I used to work in sales, and I work in engineering environments that I had no knowledge of. And I think if I walked in that sales meeting with the knowledge that I don't have, I will be incapable of selling these products. But if I walk in that meeting with the knowledge that I am a new creation in Christ Jesus and everything I step in is God, then what I don't know, they never found out. I only picked up 15 words out of the language because every shop has talk. And there's only 15, 20 words of almost any environment of humanity. And if you master the words, you can master the language. So I picked up the words that were there, and they thought I had an engineering genius mind. <laughs> then they paid me as a consultant. And I took the check. 
because I refused to take the inadequacies of the lack of knowledge and put that out in a sales room when my income was dependent on the sale. And I'm not going to be inferior to that sale. I refuse to perceive I'm to blame for the lack of revenue in my life. It's called sin. It's called a consciousness that's evil. Identifying anything that makes you inferior, anything that makes you inept, anything that makes you disqualified in any error of life. How do you think about you? How do you see you? Get in the mirror. How do you see you? Do you see you blaming yourself? Or do you see you with no account? Bought by blood, raised in power, made whole by one sacrifice, holy, unblameable, unreprovable in the sight of God. Because there's not a thing I can do with whatever happened yesterday or even a second ago. I can't change even what I set Chris up to do. How many knew it was a setup? It was a setup. Why? Because I know him. I know how he thinks. And when he changes his thinking, I'll stop doing it to him. <laughs> Is that a good deal? Because I have a son in law that does not know he's African. You know that. If you asked Feb that question, what would he answer? He would not answer that answer, would he? Okay. I'm helping him. How many need help out of the way you think? Because what we think is really what we are. It's what we project, is how we communicate. And if we blame ourselves for anything, it could be how tall we are, how short we are, how fat we are. What color we are. It doesn't matter where we came from, where we didn't come from. Whether we got a sling on, whether we don't have a sling on, whether we lost an arm, we got two arms, whatever. It doesn't make any difference. It says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without what? Wavering. For he, that wa for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto what? Love and good works. Look, how many, just ask your neighbor, how many people have you provoked lately? <laughs> to love and good works. I'm not, provo I'm not talking about provoked to anger and frustration. And <laughs> but you provoke them to love and good works. Not forsaking the assembling together of ourselves as a matter of some, but exhorting one another so much more as you see the day approaching. Now, now think about this position of thought that we all live in. We have been given the right to hold no one held by sin. We have not imputed any sin to their life whatsoever. They are free. They are absolutely like nothing has ever existed. For he was made sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the what? Righteousness of God. So that's how it is from now on. And you now have the word to connect them to God. Did, did you see Pastor Chris having a, a, a second thought? After the first word was out, it couldn't come back again. But the second word was not going to follow because there's a connection. And that connection brings the life of God. Do we connect people to the life of God? Because if we do, it comes out of them. If we don't, then they're held by whatever has, has held them. John 20, verse 21. Jesus said unto them, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and said unto them, Do what? Receive the Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, whosoever sins you remit. Now we think it is like the big things they do wrong. Well, what if it is every way they judge themselves? What if we remit everything in that person's life? How many have somebody you really want the nature of God to manifest in? Do you know how to get it manifested? Loose them and let them go completely. 
absolutely judge that one died, they are dead and every error that is, was, or could be is remitted by the power of the sacrifice and blood of Jesus. They are loose, they are freed. You say, well, then what's going to happen? The next thought will be God's. Because what you're bringing to bear is a non-adversarial environment. Do you know I love you? How do you know that? Now, how do you know that, really? How do you know I'm not just not using you? How, how do you know that, really? I mean, how do you know I'm just not using you for your great talent and gifts and abilities and, and I'm just profiting off of your abilities? How, many, how, do, you, how do you know that? Are you sure? Are you sure? Are you really positive? Could I talk you out of it? No, hmm. sir. What if I did something that would directly influence your life in a negative demeanor and cause you personal injury and harm? Would my opinion change? Yeah, would, would you still think I love you? Really? Because, see, I'm in a position I could influence him. How many are in a position you could influence people? You can say things. You can do things. You can create harm and injury. You can create detriment. But the question comes down to is how freed is your conscience and the conscience of the other person? So there's no account. So even if it is sin, it doesn't stick. Even if they do do it, whatever it is, it doesn't stick. Take a look at Romans 8. Once our mind is on the natural dimension, we cannot hear from God. Do you remember what we read in the very first scripture? Or it wasn't the first one, but it was the second set. It says the love of Christ constrains us because we thus judge. You see, if my love was affected by what I did, then he would have judged me by my actions. But if he judged me by the death of Jesus, it wouldn't matter what I did. It wouldn't stop or affect the love of God. Listen carefully. If you judge the person by what they say or do, it will take you out of the love of God. But if you judge them dead in the death of Jesus, it doesn't matter what they say and do. It still does not stop the love of God because you've judged them dead. So they're not held by what affects you. And you're not holding them to blame by what effect is in your life. Take a look. Romans 8.1. There is therefore now how much? We love this scripture, but do we know what it means? There's nothing in a penalty and a sentence imposed on a person that are in Christ Jesus. But the qualifying statement is, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Because there's, there's two qualifying statements here. There is no condemnation after the nature of the spirit of God, but there is condemnation after the nature of the flesh. There's no condemnation to them that are where? In Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has done what? Made me free from the law of sin and death. Now, what is the law of sin and death? What the law of sin and death does is it identifies a sin and I die because of it. I know you missed it. Now, I can't experience God. I know I missed it, now I can't experience God. I know we missed it, now we can't experience God. We just got in an argument, now God can't even work in our marriage. We just had a financial mess, now God can't even move in our finances. So as soon as the law of sin is present, death is resident. It's called the law of sin and death. As soon as there's blame, the instant there's blame, there's death grip in that environment. Instantly. Bam. It steps in. So you say, well, where's the freedom from condemnation? Oh, I'm glad you asked. Let's read. It says, for what the law could not do, 
that's the law of Moses, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. That, meaning that in his flesh, sin was made full condemnation. That, the righteousness of the law, meaning the, the right standing that the law intended to do to bring the person in right fellowship with God, might be fulfilled in who? Us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh mind the things of the flesh. Their mind is reactionary. They think in terms of their birth order. I'm the second son, therefore I have these traits in my life. I'm the fourth son, so I'm in this category. I am the only daughter of the house. So I, how many of you know people that have categorized themselves by birth order? I'm the first son, so there's this, I'm the, the ruling entity of the house, when in fact, <laughs> that mindset has created within them a consciousness of sin. And those that mind the flesh, this is what happens. It doesn't matter what flesh atmosphere it is. It could be birthright, it could be action, it could be sin, it could be missing the mark, whatever it is. They that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is what? Death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. It's not subject to the law of God. And this is an awesome statement. Neither indeed can be. So then, if there's blame in my mind, I know I cannot hear God. So then I'm not disappointed when I don't. And I don't expect to in an accusation mindset. Because I know that if I think, oh, he's African. If I get that thought, there's no God going to speak through me at all. Because if I ever see, that's why I've, I've enjoyed going around the world being in so many different cultures. Because, like, I, I ran into this in Vietnam when I was in, in Indonesia years ago. I, I had a lot of friends killed in Vietnam. And there was a man going into Vietnam to do a missionary work. We had 15, 20,000 people in this big arena in Jakarta, Indonesia. And they asked me to lay hands on this guy going into North Vietnam because there had been some open doors. And, and I couldn't do it. I mean, you had all these thousands of people waiting for me to lay hands on him and send him out. And I said, I'm sorry, I can't do it. I've judged the guy. I said, not the man going, but the people he's going to. Because I've lost a lot of friends and I'm not, I've still judged them for causing the death of my friends. My brother was shot over there, hit with a grenade. I mean, all kinds of stuff happened. How many had stuff that happened? The problem is I'm in front of 20,000 people. But I can't fake it till you make it. This is real or it's not. Either God is present or you can't fake God. You, you can't pray like God's going to do something when you know you're not there. So I, I said, you either got the wrong person laying hands on him or come back tomorrow and I'll clear out my life. I mean, a place went, <gasps> I said, look, don't worry. You all got the same judgments. It's just about somebody else. It could be about the Chinese. If we laid hands on the Chinese, you should have seen the judgments of the Indonesian against the Chinese. It is unbelievable. So I brought up the Chinese, and you could feel that. I said, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Because there had been a major war that went on in the country. And, and these realities occur in every society. It occurs in every geographic region. It occurs in, in people groups. It occurs in families. It occurs, it doesn't matter who, it doesn't matter what, it doesn't matter when, but it does occur. And have we remitted to the place where we are free? I remember the next night we came back, man, God moved. God, I mean, that guy, I was so free because I was holding in my life a blame because I lost and somebody had to pay. So the North Vietnamese were at fault. I just categorized them all. We go through this. How much of it is in us? And we really don't ever get under the magnifying glass where somebody says, is it there? 
and you can't hide. Because when you got the microphone, it only takes somebody born again to know whether you're talking from God or not. You know, I mean, it really doesn't. It's, there's no place to hide, especially with a microphone, unless you are got everybody deceived. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, so spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be, so that they that are what? In the flesh cannot please God. But you're not in the flesh, but where? In the spirit, if it is that the spirit of God dwells in you. And if anybody doesn't have the spirit of God, he's none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. So here we are. And tonight, we have a place of freeing our thinking. Are you ready to do it? Let's all stand up before God. We're going to do it. There's a lot more scriptures here. We talk about the enemy deceiving. The book of Job, I talk about where the enemy speaks to God and accuses Job. And then we go down where we're risen with Christ. We're far above all principality and power. But you know, if we can't get beyond this in our thinking, everything else is just going to be words. It's just going to be words. Somebody doesn't receive what they think that they should have received. We look for who to blame. But God has given us access to remit. Just thank God you are freed by the power of one sacrifice. It's just clear the atmosphere so that there is in you nothing that imputes sin nothing God we are freed we are loosed let go we have ended all that identifies because we are and have no, nothing in us that imputes sin in another life. Nothing. Nothing. Hmm. Oh, you know what just happened to me, Pastor Chris? When I said, I know you, when I said that, I just heard the Spirit of God said, you don't know him like I know him because you knew him after what he said, not after what I said. Um. And I'm listening to this and I'm saying, oh, that's right. So when I set him up, it was because I knew him after his flesh. We need new thoughts. <laughs> How many need new thoughts? Because God has a new thought. Because he would have never thought that. He never thinks that. And I know you don't think that. <laughs> Have you got something in your life somebody could easily say that you know that you think about you? What when they can't find anything that you think about you? And all that's there is a purged conscience by the blood of Jesus. Purged. You don't see yourself inferior. You don't see yourself categorized. You don't see yourself held by any. You don't see yourself being a victim of any environment, circumstance, or situation. I remember I lost one of my teeth one time. Have you ever had a front tooth missing and smile at somebody? Do you know what that does to you? Oh. Oh. Man, you try to figure out, how do I smile? I, get I mean, this thing speaks such volumes. All because you judge yourself. That without a grill. <laughs> oh, just thank God. I, 
I remember when I lost one of my eye teeth a couple years ago, broke right off. And I thought, well, we'll have to put the camera on the left side. And I thought, we don't have a camera on the left side. <laughs> we can't do that. Oh, just cut yourself free. I mean, really, lighten up. You have a consciousness that's been purged by blood that you're not known as a victim. You're not known as the actions. You're not known as your words. You're known after the sacrifice of one perfect sacrifice, Jesus. That he made you holy, unblameable, unreprovable in his sight. My God, I bless you. Oh, my Father, we bless you. Just judge yourself dead so that there's nothing from your actions, from anyone's actions that can hold you. God, we acknowledge our life freed from all human interaction and all result and resolve. God, we see ourselves fully, completely, absolutely unquestionably in every dimension under any judgment under any word and action under all history separated through death freed from that which would bind and deter and hold us and our conscience is purged from every work that's dead to serve the living God God, our spirit, we follow after hard in knowing you. <laughs> spirit of the living God, we connect in the presence of your grace, in the remission of sin, in the acknowledging of death. God, we are free. We are freed. Oh, my God. My Father. Yes. Go ahead, just, just peel off every layer of that who's to blame and declare you're dead to it. Remit it. God, loose. <laughs> we carry a word in us and don't impute sin in another's life. God, we are freed. <laughs> There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of life that is in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. Freed. Freed. Freed from judging. Freed from recording. Freed from even blaming God for what didn't happen that we expected. The enemy has no voice against him who is holy. God, we bless you. I know people that have turned in their heart from God because they expected God to do something. When it didn't happen, they blame God for what didn't happen. And this judgment steps in. And all it is is the accuser finding somebody to blame. And if the enemy can blame God, man, he can take you out. But if there is in you the Spirit of Christ who has risen you, and you are placed in that awesome body of sacrifice, raised in the power of resurrection and washed by that very blood, 
then you also remit the sin of every judgment and error. God, we bless you. We bless you. Father, tonight we resign from the blame game in our mind. We cancel the voice through the power of the blood of Jesus and we declare we stand in a place of the perfect law of liberty and the grace and the power of your anointing in the blood through the sacrifice. We stand in your nature far above all principality, power, might, dominion, every name that is named not only in this world but in that which is to come. God, this nature has conquered not only this world but the world that is yet to be manifest. God, we bless you. Do you know you have the nature that doesn't just conquer everything that's present in this current earth, but the one after this gets burned up and the next one that gets manifested, the nature that's in you is far above all principality, power, might, dominion, every name that is named, not only in this world, but in that which is to come. This nature doesn't get stopped. Creation and the new creation and everything that gets consumed and everything gets reborn has no power to hold it down. God, we are alive in you. Alive in you. Alive in you. God, we're alive in you. Messo frengo na sele mango do sorrenda karabandache we. Now, Pastor Chris, how do people see you? Holy, unblameable, righteous. Yeah. Wow. Mm. Chosen, accepted in the beloved. I know. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Just look at your neighbor and say, how do you see me? How do you see me? How, how do you see me? Hmm? Wow. How do you see you? Yeah. Oh. Freed from all guilt and condemnation, all judgment, loose from every yoke of bondage. I mean, freed from every voice of accusation. You are unbelievable. You can't be improved on. You're the highest, the best that God has. My God. The choicest of the choice of the pick of God's elect. You are the select that God said, I'll take you for my own and I'll give you to no one else. I'll hold you for mine and I'll keep you for my own and I will speak to you. And no one and nothing will have his grip on you and nothing can take you from my hands and nowhere and nothing from the enemy to hell on this earth can steal what I have raised you. Oh, For you're the product of a perfect completion, sacrifice. What he did is holy in you. Complete. So solid. There's not a mar in it. I mean, just a reflection of him makes me blinded <laughs> by the glory of the awesome God that he made you. Oh, I'm glad to know you. What a joy. My father. Wow. I mean, we need to provoke one another. Yes. Provoke them to love and the works that God has called. Because they're qualified. They are fully able. Completely, absolutely capable. Take you with all the lack of knowledge you have and put you in a place you know nothing and you're a master of it. Pick up 10 words and you can rule the room. It's who you are. Oh, 
I look at you and say, I'm so awesome, I'm even amazed at myself. How many of you are just so awesome, you're just amazed at yourself? I mean, aren't you so awesome, Herb, that you're just amazed at yourself? I know, man, it's like, wow. How could God have made such an awesome selection and left me here for this long? And not taking me back for himself, he just must be wanting me. You know, I mean, I don't know about you, but I feel like I'm on loan. Because the God who valued me is, is like, he's got to get me back. So I'm on loan to you for a while, but I'll be there for eternity, so enjoy the journey while I'm here. And whatever you do, don't account any sin because there's nothing going to stick. Unblameable. My God, I'm going to live this way. I'm going to think this way and speak this way. Because I am this way. One of the fellows in the church just got a job as a... Uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, a pharmacist. And he was telling me the, the wage that he was offered. And he said, you look surprised. And I said, no, not at you. Because it's well over a hundred and some thousand dollars a year he's offered right out of college, first job. 130,000 start. And I said, I'd never think less. He goes, I was shocked. <laughs> how you just want to be shocked is how awesome God is to you. I mean, that's how your life is. Just thank God you're the recipient of that great grace that's abounding in your life. My God. <laughs> Where could we go to step into such freedom and grace? But in your loving kindness and tender mercies, my God. God, so let our thoughts, let our actions, our words constantly speak as a, a resolve and a result as an oracle of God. The accuser of our brethren is cast down and we overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. And the word of our testimony. And we love not our lives, even to the death. God, nothing gave us personal adherence. We acknowledge you in every way. In Jesus' name. Amen. How many got some new thoughts tonight? Isn't God a good God? I mean, I just got a new one when I set Pastor Chris up. And then I hear from God that why I set him up is because I heard what he said about himself and then I acted on it. I thought, no, no. I didn't do that, did I? Thank God there's no record. Because otherwise, we'd have record after record after record. How you doing? How you feeling about yourself? Oh, you're looking so awesome. I'm just privileged to get to see you tonight. Do you know what it's like to be that free that there's not a record of your history? Amen. There is nothing on you at all but God's favor. Yes. That, that's all that's there. And it's like, it's like such a joy leaps within that you just can't stand how awesome the favor is that just envelops your life. Yes. And how much when you step next in your steps of life, you're going to find the things that you thought were against you are now working for you. And you're going to see even the very hostilities that you thought were just going to be there for the rest of your life are so turned around and God's favor is overwhelming you. Because what God has set you for is not what you've come from. It's what he raised you to. Amen. 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 I'm just glad to know you. Amen. Bless you. Wow. Wow. Wow, what a day to be alive. 
Just go ahead and turn to somebody and just speak what they are in Christ. Go ahead, find somebody, look them in the eye and just tell them. Go ahead and let him know. He needs to hear more. Somebody tell me. Well, how are you making out? What made you do so awesome? Isn't it an awesome freedom? Oh my God. It is the most incredible liberty and grace. It is, and I sometimes I guess you make your mindset that is it really me? Yeah, it is you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, brought me from such a long way. What are you doing with my life right now? I know. Isn't it awesome? It's awesome. It's awesome. I constantly tell my wife that. That's right. Just tell them to keep appreciating you. It keeps getting more value, right? <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, what a day to be alive. Well, are you all happy? How are you feeling inside? That's my son. I'm just ecstatic. He's my son. So you know. You have an awesome son. Amen. I mean, awesome crowned with glory and honor. I mean, set as a select. Wow, what a privilege. What a privilege. What a privilege. Oh. Well, what do we do now? I mean, really, where do you go from here? Home? Lola says home. I'd always count on Lola. I'd see her smiling face and I'd just be reminded of the great grace and loving kindness. What's that? You go back and pester him. Go over and pester him? <laughs> uh, I get off on Lola. She ends up with miracles happening. I've <laughs> seen them before. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, you're ready to bless the living God and give to him and just worship him? I mean, what is giving but nothing more than a worship unto the living God and honor to his name?